Thank you very much. Um, one of the advantages of early middle age is that you forget a lot of what you said, so Falk, I don't remember that. But I think the other thing about, um, uh, uh, you know, coming on at the end of the first day is that you end up repeating a lot of what other people have said. So I'm probably in much of what I'm going to say in the process of reproducing ideas that many people have had before. But, there, you know, that, that, that's part of learning as well, of course, learning how to say something yourself. So uh, I, I don't mind... Uh, uh, doing this. So um, I think I am going to be talking about technology and um, uh, technology has come up a little bit today. I mean, someone talked about the material world and so on. Um, but technology, of course, in the experience of modernity, of industrialization, is often seen as one of the drivers or facilitators, uh, framers of transformative change and certainly where I come from, from uh, innovation studies, uh, technology is often seen as the sort of the starting point of the way in which we, we start talking about change and transformation. And I'll try to talk about what are the fundamental features of these kinds of socio-technical transformations. Right, I'm going to have trouble with this, this thing in the same way as the previous person. What do I do? Do I have to point it? Yeah, that would be great, actually. If you could just, that's much easier. Yeah, okay. So, um, thank you very much. Um, so, this is going to be collaboration. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> there are a number of different terms, of course, that are, um, you know, in the ether. Um, I was speaking to my kids, actually, about change recently. My kids are early... 20s, they're both students in Amsterdam, and uh, there was, they, were, they were interesting about transformation because they said, you know, we actually believe in the current deeply dysfunctional world where you have political crisis and failed states and huge imbalances in the world, that we're in the, f in the, in the dawn of a huge transformation. We don't know what it's going to be, but there's a kind of expectation of some kind of great discontinuity, I think, amongst young people anyway. And I think that's also reflected in the kind of discourses that we have and why we have right now, for instance, a, a program about transformation and that funders and others are attracted to that because it's somehow there is a great narrative right now about transformation. It's out there. It's reflected in ideas of transition, of tipping points, a lot of debate, of course, in popular culture about tipping points, thresholds. In global change science, we talk about thresholds and tipping points. So this idea about complex systems reaching the limits of their reproducibility and of some discontinuity and of a change into a new state is really all around us. And I think that's both refreshing and deeply terrifying, of course. Um, but anyway, it's, it's all there, and I think... In, in unraveling what we might mean by transformation in this program, we also need to, I think, uh, draw on uh, the current debate around these kinds of ideas. Next slide. So we've had a debate this afternoon about um, incremental and, and radical change. Uh, and um, in the work on technical change anyway, we tend to avoid this kind of debate. Um, the main reason is that the, the great economist of technical change, Chris Freeman, always said that it depends on where you stand, whether something is incremental or radical. So if I take a simple artifact like a ballpoint pen, for producers of fountain pens, the emergence of the ballpoint was, of course, a radical change because it was destructive of their markets, it was destructive of capabilities and so on. And yet for the user, the writer, it was not. It was merely an incremental change in the way in which ink was applied to a pen. And once um, these kinds of pens uh, changed to being made not from metal anymore but from plastic, that was a radical change for metal and plastic makers of pens but it was not a radical change for the user. It was simply an incremental change. So 
Um, I think in work on um, uh, uh, change, including transformative change, um, people who work on technological innovation tend to avoid uh, making distinctions between radical and incremental change. Incremental change over a long period of time adds up, of course, to radical change. So that's an important point as well. And another important thing here is that incremental change is normal. It's uh, uh, something that is uh, 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 quite uh, 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 part of the background of evolutionary change in, in socio-technical systems, whereas radical change is something which is very rare. Actually, it's extremely rare. And therefore, if you're going to look for huge changes over time, much of that will actually emerge from incremental evolutionary change, um, and that is something I think we, we should expect as well. Now, this is a debate which continues. Incremental and radical change happen side by side in complementary ways, but uh, I think that's an important idea that we need to hold on to. Next slide. So here's an example of that. This is the production of paper. This is... Um, uh, the production of paper in 1850. It's the machine invented by the Frudrinier brothers, the French Huguenots who, who, who invented this machine in England. Uh, and you have uh, a modern machine, uh, which is still called a Frudrinier machine, um, uh, able to produce paper of a much finer quality and of a, a much larger capacity, of course. These machines are, you know, can be... Uh, half a kilometer long now and producing half a million tons of paper a year. It's a radically different kind of thing in, in, in terms of the control, in terms of uh, you know, the way in which it works. There's hardly anyone, anyone working there anymore. You can have dark mills now. But it's still recognizably the same thing. It's rollers. You, you put wet stuff on it, you dry it, and you, it comes off as paper. Um, and so is that, that's obviously uh, the outcome of, of a series of incremental changes over a period of 160 years or so, but it is also a radical break in terms of, uh, you know, what, what, what is really happening there and the kinds of technologies which are being applied. Next slide. Here's another example. So the, these are recognizably both cars. Uh, they're things with four wheels. They carry people. They have an engine uh, at the front. Um, but... There are also huge differences, of course, between one and the other. And I think the important, thing to, the important point to make here about radical changes, of course, this, this is a history of 100 years of a technology. And so change, in one sense, is, is rapid. I mean, we, we see the autom automobile as a highly innovative product. We're, you know, we're confronted with new models every year. And yet there's this... You know, long incremental history of change of this artifact. And yet, of course, the thing, uh, you know, I think this is a Ford, isn't it, uh, in, in, in the corner, what a beautiful thing it is, um, is clearly a quite difficult, different kind of artifact than the, the Model T that's at the top, um, involving all sorts of new capabilities, electronics, and the efficiency, the performance of it is quite, quite different, uh, radically different, I would say. Next slide. And here's another slightly different example, of course, because this, these both talk about telephony. Um, and yet I think we would all be able to agree that fixed-line telephony was something different than mobile telephony, even though they're all about the transmission of voice over space. Um, and clearly the artifacts look very different now, in one sense, uh, they may be quite similar. I mean, when I make a phone call, the experience of talking to the person at the other end is the same now as it would have been in the 1920s had I had the thing on the, on the left there. And yet, of course, we also know, we see, we receive uh, the iPhone as a, as a fundamentally transformative product which is able to do all sorts of other things for us as well. So I think this point about incremental and radical is a, is a tricky line to, 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 to make and I think it's one that we need to be uh, uh, cognizant of throughout. Next slide. So then the question of what 
what changes in a, in, a, in a transformation. And I think we've had a lot of these kinds of ideas here as well, and this is why I want to say I'm repeating a lot of what's already been said. Now, uh, we had the, the argument that um, uh, 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 transformation is about qualitative change, and therefore a lot of that probably is about something that's happening within a system, uh, and probably related to, in some sense, structural change in the system. And by, by structures, one, one, one means the, the relationships between actors or, 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 or parts, functions within, within a system. So clearly there's something, when we talk about transformation, we may be talking about, in some sense, the restructuring of uh, systems that are delivering some kind of social function. Secondly, and I think this comes out of my argument about the iPhone or the, uh, the, the Ford Focus, there clearly something about the performance of systems which can also be transformed, uh, or the functions that they're carrying out. The iPhone is carrying out different functions than you know, the standard telephone that was on the, on the desk uh, at home or in the office. Thirdly, uh, transformations may be seen in terms of the actors involved or the relationships between actors. Um, and I'll, I'll develop that a little bit. Fourthly, you might be concerned with changes of rules or institutions. So the, uh, the ways in which uh, uh, um, uh, relationships are, are managed or regulated or reproduced. Um, those might be the elements of a system that you're interested in understanding or following in a transformation. And then perhaps more, most deeply, and I, I, I think also a lot of people who have written about technical change often argue that the fundamental changes may be cultural, actually, to do with normative change. So the changes that are important are not to do with the material world at all, or even the institutional context within which those artifacts are embedded and used and reproduced, but really a whole set of attitudes and normative beliefs, uh, what is good and what is not bad and what is acceptable and so on, which actually underlies, underlies all of that. And the iPhone is representing liberty uh, and uh, 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 connectedness. Uh, that is actually perhaps the essential thing about that transformation uh, uh, that is represented by that, act, uh, that, by that artifact. Next slide. So this is a picture of um, you know, a socio-technical system as it's uh, 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 represented by Frank Hales. Many of you will, will know this, this figure. It, it shows that technologies, of course, are deeply embedded uh, in, 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 in infrastructures, uh, 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 in uh, institutions, in practices, in norms, in symbolic systems, and so on. So this is the, uh, 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 as it were, the socio-technical configuration for what he calls personal transportation, the car. Um, and when we talk about transformation of this system, we might be, and this is the problem with conceiving about, uh, it's conceiving of transformation or thinking of uh, radical transformation, you, you probably are looking at the reconfiguration or the adjustment of each of these connected facts or, or processes or practices and it's the problem of how each of those adjustments cumulatively in a connected way come about through time that is so complex to envisage and understand and track and, and why in fact these kinds of systems become so embedded and why they carry so much inertia. So the term I haven't heard today at all is to do is path dependency. And I mean, much of the work that we do on complex system innovation very much looks at issues of inertia and path dependency. That's actually where we start. It's the very orderedness of socio-technical systems and their stability over time, which is the most interesting thing. And the idea that innovation is possible given that high orderedness is actually the, the, the surprising and interesting thing. Next slide. So what changes performance? It might be another aspect that uh, we're interested in. Next slide. Yeah, I, I think I've got a couple of examples. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm moving on. 
So here's Moore's law. This is the performance of the, the microchip. You will all know this. And clearly, the microchip in 1970 is a totally different thing than the microchip in 2010, technologically, but certainly in, in, in terms of what it can do, you know, uh, manage aircraft and, uh, you know, fly satellites to uh, uh, land on meteorites and all these kinds of things. Next, next slide. We are often concerned with transformations in, in actors, of course, changing uh, actor relationships. And there, I think, often we're interested in the role of incumbents who uh, uh, guard and reproduce uh, the stability and orderedness of socio-technical systems. And then the, the relative role of newcomers. I mean, sometimes incumbents themselves are the cause or are generative of transformations. But often it's to do with newcomers, and, 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 and certainly Adam Habib uh, uh, you know, stressed that point as well. And you know, the, the, the variety that is created by newcomers is also a very important part. Next. Rules, or what I call orders. Um, now, here we might be t t talking about very deep change, so uh, changes in institutions themselves and you know, economic paradigms, for instance, or quite shallow changes, adjustments to the rule systems, which nevertheless might have transformative changes, rules to uh, access to markets, for instance, which can have transformative changes in the way in which energy markets work, for instance. So I think there are those kinds of aspects of transformations which we would need to be looking at. Next slide. And finally, norms. I've, I've spoken about that already, but these are sometimes the deepest and most interesting changes that are, are happening. Another feature about transformation, of course, and that's come up as well today, is to do with uh, slow and gradual change or fast and abrupt change. This is slightly different than the d debate about incremental or radical. Um, uh, I think a lot of transformation is probably going to be slow and gradual, and therefore we need to have a deep historical uh, 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 context within which to see it. But, of course, some changes are revolutionary, are abrupt, are, are sudden, uh, and discontinuities are a, a, an important feature. So the speed of change, is an, or the momentum involved in the change, is another important feature of transformation. So here's an example about uh, maize yields, a very kind of uh, normal, kind of well-known thing about the Green Revolution. Clearly something happened in the 1940s that shifted uh, the, uh, the development of yields of maize in the, in, in the, this is in the US, but these technologies are obviously diffused around the world. And this continues to be a change and a revolutionary change which is happening today. Next, next slide. Here's an example of um, search engines. This is the cert first search engine that was um, launched in 1996, Lycos. It's amazing how, uh, how recent that is, really. But, of course, we know that there's an exponential growth in the way in which search is done uh, on the Internet and uh, all sorts of new uh, possibilities, new kinds of uh, uh, things are being uh, transmitted through the World Wide Web. And, and I think most people would, would see, and certainly the way the commentary is around the Internet, this is a radical, transformative change that uh, is measurable in this way. We have a question about how narrow a transformation is or how broad or how wide it is. So I have an example here, which is also a very sort of standard, well-known example. So we might be interested in uh, simply the conversion of electricity systems away from fossil-based uh, 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 power sources towards more renewable uh, power sources, or we might, so the substitution of a windmill for a, uh, for a, a coal-fired power station delivering kilowatt hours into, into the home or into businesses, or we may be interested in a much more complicated network change to do with the emergence of a, a microgrid, for instance. So this is a question about the narrowness or the, the breadth of a transformation, which I think is important. And then finally, another feature which, of course, has, has come up uh, a lot today is to do with inten intentionality. Much history of uh, technolo technological uh, change uh, really doesn't uh, say very much about purposive change. It imagines that transformations are frequently emergent. So I have an example 
a couple of examples. But clearly that isn't always the case, and I think someone had, a, had an idea of that earlier. The emergence of steam power is to a large extent, I think, probably an emergent one, although there were, there were clearly planned elements to it. But post-war, the development of nuclear power all around the world was clearly a very strictly planned process involving states uh, and international organizations and was an attempt at a purposive transformation of electricity systems. There are different theories of transformation. There are more circular ones and revolutionary ones or, or, or evolutionary ones. Next. There are different narratives, and this has come up uh, today as well. I think you can choose your narrative about growth and development, Schumpeter, uh, 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 you know, adaptive uh, uh, theories of change, or theories of disordering and ordering, reordering. I'm hurrying up. Next slide. So I think these are broadly the kind of features of transformation that one might be concerned with if you're going to do an analysis of transformation. The first is to do with the, the sort of the scale, the scale of it, uh, its nature, whether it's incremental or radical, how fast it is or the amount of momentum or inertia or path dependency involved in it, the scope of it, whether it's quite a narrow thing or, or something that's broad, the degree of intentionality that you might be ascribing to it, and I believe that all transformations have a bit of emergence and a bit of intentionality in them, and the kind of narrative that you're going to employ, the theory of change, as it were, that you might be using. I think that's pretty much it. Thank you very much.